Good afternoon and welcome to a webinar on an alphabet soup of regulatory requirements beyond those of FDA, hosted by EAS Consulting Group and presented by EAS Independent Consultant Bob Lavieri. EAS, a member of the certified group of companies, is a leader in regulatory solutions for industries regulated by FDA and USDA, with strong capabilities in EPA and OSHA compliance as well. Our global network of over 150 independent advisors and consultants enables EAS to provide comprehensive consulting, training, and auditing services, ensuring proactive regulatory compliance. Today's presenter is Bob Lavieri, who is an expert in the development and delivery of governance programs. Let me just get to his slide here. Uh, government programs for the development of sustainable compliance systems. His expertise lies in design, development, and implementation of SOPs, GMPs, best practices, as well as compliance with OSHA, EPA, DOT, and others. In addition to consulting, Mr. Lavieri is a frequently requested trainer, educating manufacturers on hazardous waste operations, process safety management, risk management, process hazard analysis, as well as hazardous communication. As a reminder, during the webinar, you may ask any questions by typing them into the questions box, and we'll hold all questions for the end. And with that, I will say thank you again for joining EAS, and I'll turn the presentation over to Bob. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, there that was we go, okay, we got our, our slides up and running. Uh, again, good afternoon and welcome to this discussion. I, I think it's particularly timely uh, that we have discussions like this as many of us are involved uh, in the food and uh, uh, cosmetic or drug regulatory area. And sometimes some of these other things get left by the side. So I think uh, we'll, we're gonna spend some time today, go through a number of slides and, and cover bits and pieces of the alphabet soup, which uh, we've all been exposed to over our our careers. Uh, and, and really the way to think of it is a set of gears and, and all of it meshes nicely. Much of the information that we have for food safety, for instance, is similar information that's used in uh, other of the RECRA or um, uh, EPA uh, programs. So I think we're, we're going to kind of touch on those things as we go along. Uh, Okay, there we go. Get this going the right way. Okay, um, so, so uh, part of the part of what we're doing here is we're talking about uh, help me with some regs, you know. And so if you, if uh, the famous joke is if you think OSHA is uh, a small town in Wisconsin, you're in trouble. So it is not. Um, but there are other things to think about: uh, communication standards that are in 1910, 1200, uh, which really the heart and soul of this work is really a safety data sheet. Um, your company pre uh, prepares them and uh, you receive them. And so in both cases, it's important to really understand it's kind of like the blueprint for where we go as we move forward. Um, EPCRA uh, or the uh, Emergency Planning Community Right to Know Act, uh, Section 313 is another area that's very important. And um, you can see on the slide, as well as I can, that, that the uh, kind of where this plays, and it's in, it's important that we uh, we do the right things with it. Okay, uh, one of the first questions that we always want to ask ourselves is, are we in compliance? And um, and this is a tough question for all of you out there to answer, and. Um, but it's an important one to ask. And oftentimes people say, well, I kind of think so. Uh, but I, I always like to say my favorite phrase is 100% compliant, 100% of the time, and we know it. And you might say, well, that's impossible. <laughs> and I'm going to say to you, well, let's talk. Um, and and, and uh, where is Timbuktu and how do I know? <laughs> so Timbuktu, for all of you that don't know, actually is a town in California. So if we have anybody in the webinar today from California, there is a small town out there. Um, and it's uh, it's kind of like uh, it's, there are things that we can know that other people don't know. And I think the 100% compliant 100% time and we know it is important. And uh, we're going to talk about that. Okay. 
So from a structure standpoint, um, let's think for a moment. You got the Environmental Protection Agency, so the EPA, and the Occupational Health and Safety Agency, OSHA, both are two governmental uh, groups. And in fact, we may have some people from either or both of those on the call today. Um, and, and they are the ones that <clears throat> really we're going to focus our, our discussion on. Um, and, and, and so in light of, of uh, what both those agencies were created to help both the community and the employees, obviously OSHA you're familiar with um, at your plant or, or organization and the EPA you are as well from a permitting standpoint uh, for air, water and, and waste. Um, and there's many other agencies that, that have been uh, created for similar purposes, but we're gonna focus on those two today because they're the ones that really come into play. Um, so RECRA is, is uh, and, and I'm going to throw around the words, but I'm going to, I've highlighted in yellow for you to see when I say that, what it's meant, if it's, if this is new to you, if it's, if it's not, please bear with me. So uh, the disposal of waste is an interesting concept. At home, um, if we use a material like uh, spray cans of paint or something to do a job in the backyard, and um, we're done, we, we actually can throw the cans uh, in most parts of the country into um, your normal uh, trash and off it goes to the landfill. It can't be done in industry. So in industry, we have to know a lot about uh, what we need to do and how we need to, to dispose of it. And, and so uh, the uh, uh, CFR, uh, Code of Federal Registers uh, regulations, uh, covers much of this information, obviously, and helps you make your way through it. But it's, it's very important and it helps us know that, yeah, we can't throw that same can of paint away, likely. Uh, we have to accumulate it and we have to then dispose of it properly and, it, and, and we help you through that. Um, Sarah, so um, some time ago, there was uh, examples of where uh, landfills from years past had leaked and contaminated water that went into either streams or drinking um, or groundwater and caused other problems around the country. And so Sarah was created. And part of Sarah is to help each one of us know uh, what, based on what's on our MSDS, we know what we have, where it is, and um, make sure we're making proper notification. One notification would be, let's just say, for instance, your site had a large quantity of ethanol, greater than, than uh, say, 5,000 pounds of it in a tank that you received and used in your process. Um, that would put you into a, a category where you need to notify your local emergency planning board in case of a fire at your facility, the fire department and emergency response wants to be properly prepared. By the same token, <clears throat> If you have other materials of concern and they get released from your property and you know, they could get released, uh, you need to notify the National Response Center um, of the release as well as um, have the accurate inventory. And that is all comes together through various reports in various sections. So 302, 304, 312, 313. And we'll talk about a little bit about some of those as we go on. Um, the last area we're gonna kind of or one of the last areas I'm gonna to touch on is Department of Transportation. Um, and this one is one that oftentimes cites manufacturing facilities, warehouses, or third-party warehouses trip up on um, because they don't necessarily realize that the, 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 the salient words are there. No person may offer except a hazardous material um, for transportation and commerce, unless that person is registered and if the material is clock reclassified, described, packaged, and marked and labeled. And that's the definition right out of the, right out of the CFR. And it's a very important concept uh, because oftentimes uh, we need to, we don't properly train people or we don't have good documentation that they have been trained. They don't know what they're, they don't know what they're shipping, what the proper way to package it is. And it's all spelled out um, <clears throat> in, in this, in this subsection. So, this is a very key area, which a lot of small businesses that are just starting up can really get themselves in trouble and they need help. And this is a, a great opportunity for people with the knowledge to step in and help them. <clears throat> so uh, what, if, what if you're out there and you say, well, I'm a, 
uh, I supply an ingredient to a company and, and what do I need to know? And so here we're going to start throwing some of the, the acronyms at you. Um, but, but one is the safety data sheet. What is one? How do I get one? What does it say? And, and, and uh, so a little bit about that. There are published. And of course, today you can use uh, Google and find about anything. But uh, there are published standards on what a, what a, a, a SDS is, what it contains, what it needs to contain. And, uh, and everybody should have one for each one of the materials that they, they produce. And they should expect one from each one of you know, their suppliers who ship them either intermediate or um, raw materials. <clears throat> Normally, that's due the first shipment of the new year is the standard. Um, in terms of, uh, we talked a little bit about EFGRO, but reporting to who, when, and how, I bet the best way to think of this is um, that there, there are in your state, in your district and, and some states are a little bit different than others um, about who you report to and when and how you do it. But um, some great resources for this is to start with your local emergency planning uh, board, which usually is the fire department, but it can be someone different. And certainly the fire department would be able to point you in the right direction if you're unaware, if you're a new company. Um, and that tells you what reports you need to fill out and so forth and so on. Uh, Sarah and the famous list of lists. Uh, um, one uh, a very good thing that has been done is there's a great list of materials that are considered hazardous and need to have um, need to be called out on the SCS number one, and uh, second of all, they they have may have um, specific disposal requirements, which which you should know if you have them. And so if you receive a raw material from a vendor and uh, you use it and you have some material left over that you've deemed waste, and, and we could go through that, is it waste or not? Uh, we could talk about that at great length. Uh, but uh, if it is, you need to make sure it's disposed of uh, properly, the cradle to grave concept. Um, and then there's been a whole bunch of uh, new chemicals called PFAS chemicals that have been added to that list <clears throat> that, uh, this year, there was some uh, reporting requirements that you notify companies if, if any of your raw materials contain any of, the, any of these uh, chemicals. Uh, and that'll be something that you'll do ongoing uh, when you send out your uh, SDSs at the beginning of each year. Dangerous goods. So the Department of Transportation uh, recognizes that uh, certain things will be in commerce and move from point A to point B. And that's when you see the trucks on the road with the placards on the side. And um, it's a highly regulated uh, world that we live in from the standpoint of that, which is a good thing. It protects all of us as we drive on the same highways as these materials do. Um, and when you offer something for transportation, you really need to make sure that you're adequately informing the transportation company on what you're doing um, and make sure that you're hiring someone who knows and it's skilled and has certifications to handle and transport dangerous goods. <clears throat> uh, RECRA uh, waste disposal. So when we think of waste and disposal of waste, um, again, this is a well identified and, and uh, requires well training, but once you're trained, it's pretty straightforward um, how we do that. So I think a, a good way to jump into this a little bit, and it might help some people with uh, with some thoughts of where we're going is, and uh, I, I kind of create a little ca a case study, and then you can read it as as well as I can. But this is uh, not a a um, atypical uh, situation. This is actually fairly common that many times uh, a couple of folks come up with a great idea, um, and they are in this particular example. Um, they're going to add some additional uh, nutrients for poultry and livestock. And so what many people have gotten smarter about today is to uh, better, uh, it, it goes along with the movement to more natural foods and things like that. But the idea is to provide some of the micronutrients and some other things uh, in feed, um, either added at the point of, of feeding the animal or uh, just upstream of there. So 
this, this uh, hypothetical company came up with this and they've they've filled out all their paperwork for the state and they and, uh, and they are ready to go here um, but what other compliance concerns might they have and so they're using a, a material sodium selenite and um, it's used in one or more of their products and often referred to as salt. And um, there's quite a bit of information out there in the, in, in the uh, trade about how it provides benefits uh, as a micronutrient. But, but what about compliance outside of what, what we just think about from a food safety standpoint is, do they, did this company have a globally harmonized SDS? Now globally harmonized, for those of you that don't know, is that the the whole world now has got on a system where we have globally harmonized SDSs. So the information, so a, a, a material purchased in, uh, let's say, Italy, that's used by a company in Nebraska, um, could very, it, it will be able to read and utilize that SDS or something made in Australia, shipped to California, again, would be used as well as the same SDS would be used if the product was made in New York and shipped to Texas. So uh, very similar. Um, so uh, this company that we're talking about here receives a small amount, uh, uh, about 200 pounds a month, and it stores in a plant. The plant is well lit, materials well labeled, and, and all that good stuff. And it's stored for the requirements of the vendor, which oftentimes is something else you'll find on, on an SDS. Um, but the questions start to begin with, um, is that all that they store in a nice well-lit place and it's in good shape and, and used? Well, not exactly. So, uh, the MSDS, uh, that the company had shows that the hundred pounds of it is the threshold planning quantity. So this again, gets back to some of the, uh, uh, EPRA, uh, issues. It's also a Sarah 313 chemical. So if you went to the list of lists uh, that's listed for Sarah, you'll find that material as a listed uh, material. Now what? <laughs> that's always the question that comes from the plant manager or the plant engineer or somebody, the scientist, and says, oh, gosh, now what? Um, so, so what they need to do is they need to notify the local emergency planning council, and um, they need to have this material uh, let them know where it is and if they have it in larger than the threshold planning quantity, which they do. Um, some people say, hmm, sound familiar or confused, and some people don't know what to do. But again, start with the fire department. Um, and then that's it, right? Well, no. <laughs> We've meshed a few gears, but not, but not all the gears. So uh, a lot of this material, uh, not some of this material may end up as waste. So is a hazardous material a hazardous waste? That's always a great question. And the answer is, well, maybe or maybe not. Uh, but in the case of this, uh, again, by looking on your SDS and by finding it as on the list of lists, that makes it a hazardous waste. And um, then you, from the list of lists, you'll be able to go back to RECRA and be able to look in there and see, okay, now I know I've got a hazardous material and I've, I've got some of it to get rid of. Therefore, it's a hazardous waste because I see that it's listed that way and there'll be a prescriptive way to get rid of it. So that could include encapsulation. It could include a number of different treatment options, but that's way that you have safely, this company would have safely taken it from a raw material and dispose of it. The perfect solution is not ever have to dispose of it. And figure out a way to reuse it um, in such a way that it can be back into the same product as a, as a minor material added if possible or repurposed used in some other way uh, before um, it is it has to be disposed of and potentially recycled so always always shoot for the re words before you get to the disposal word but this material um, is if it is a hazardous material and it is a dangerous good, then we talk about DOT and OSHA. And so one is we have to, this company, again, going back to the SDS, would make sure all their employees knew 
what the material was, what hazards it presented, what the proper protective equipment would be, PPE, um, and uh, you know, from a DOT perspective, they're going to think about how am I going to transport it. I need to have whoever is putting that material in a container, and it has to be the container specified for transportation for that material. Are they trained? Are they qualified? Do I have documentation of that? Have I filled out the proper uh, hazardous waste documents for transportation? Um, have I hired a vendor who handles danger or hazardous goods? Yeah, uh, some commercial names out there. And again, this is not advertisement for any of them, but uh, your Clean Harbors uh, is one. Um, and you may know of many others in your area that you use, but all of them will transport your material uh, to a proper disposal facility, uh, which is called a treatment storage and disposal facility, um, and then provide you back with paperwork. Oftentimes the same paperwork goes to your state and on an annual basis, you settle up with the state about what you dispose of and what, what, they, uh, what they have records of you disposing of. And again, part of RECRA, which is uh, part of the EPA. Okay, um, so maybe some of you are saying, hey, tell me more, this is good stuff. And I hope, I hope you are. Uh, so so uh, as we walk down the CERA path, um, uh, the company, again, you can read this as well as I can. Um, uh, uh, they're, they're required to notify their customers. That's one of the requirements in, in CERA 313. That sodium selenate is in their product. And so how do we do that? Well, we do that with an SDS. And normally that's ahead of or with the first shipment of, of the year. Uh, and that information is included. Uh, I'm sure everyone on here is familiar with a, uh, a safety data sheet and the number of sections that are on there. And um, there's, a sec there's several different sections, but one of them covers uh, any materials that are CERA listed materials. And so that's where that information goes. Um, we used to call them, they used to be called MSDSs, so material safety data sheets, and they would be seven or eight pages. Now as an SDS, they get out to like 14 pages. So oftentimes it's a little bit more complicated to uh, find what you're looking for, but there's a treasure trove of good information there. So now we're starting to get in the deep end of the pool. Um, and uh, as we do that, we, we, we've talked a little bit about the hazardous material or a dangerous good um, that's rolling down the highway that left your plant. And, uh, you know, hazardous waste is, is always a tough, it can be a tough call to make because um, if you shoveled it up off the floor, it may be that it, it, it's, a, it's a waste and it may be hazardous. If it's a bad batch, again, it may be waste and it may be hazardous, but have you thought about ahead of time, not, a, not, in the, not when the plant's down for half a day because of, of something, but uh, at the prior to that is, well, if this happens, then what? Can we recycle it? Can we repurpose it? Can we reuse it? Um, and and if, that's, if that's all, that should be the direction you go. If you can't, then um, does it have hazardous uh, characteristics? So is it flammable? Uh, is it reactive? Um, and there are there are several other uh, attributes like that that are characteristics. Or does it or is it a listed material? In our case of sodium selenate, it is a listed material. And so each one of these situations requires a real good compliance review and plan. I often encourage people to come up with a plan ahead of the incident. Or the, or the accident or whatever you want to call it at your site. But before the trouble hits, let's have a plan for how to, how to deal with it. Okay, so we've kind of kind of meshed some of these parts together. Uh, we talked about your raw materials and that the word SDS keeps popping up and that's, a, that's on here. Um, the Department of Transportation plays a key role in, in transporting materials to you and also uh, uh, finished product and waste away from you. Um, EPCRA is your community 
and the, the area that you live in where your families are and your, your children or grandchildren go to school um, to make sure that we are properly handling and storing and um, have a good plan in case of an incident to respond. Uh, OSHA, for the people that work in your site, if it's a new plant and it's a few people, it's small numbers, uh, it's still important. If it's a large plant, same thing, large quantity, same thing, that we need to make sure our people are properly protected from the health effects associated with uh, the materials that we have. And then our customers. And so, uh, I mean, the reason why we're all in business is to, is to uh, sell products or services to customers. And as those customers uh, expect, and we as good citizens of the community, is that we make them aware of what concerns with, with our raw or intermediate materials that, that we sell to them. I think that's important. And then some of the big players, um, RECRA, which is, um, has to do with disposal of uh, hazardous waves. And, and SARA, which is designed to uh, protect the environment from our waste. And then, um, you know, air, air, your site will have an air permit likely, and you have a stormwater permit and a wastewater permit. And all those things go together. Um, but but it, it really starts at the beginning with what you're doing at your facility. So as we jump back to the case study, um, this, this small company had a smart idea, a couple of young folks that uh, were familiar and capable of using spreadsheets, and they made a, a great spreadsheet uh, that they just created themselves. It has all the chemicals used and sold by them. And so now they knew everything they had. Then they were able to go look and say, okay, is it on the list? Is it on the list of lists? Is it a Sarah chemical? And so forth and so on. So you can simply create that. Uh, yourself, and, uh, or, or people can be glad to help you with it. Um, then they identified who their customers were, which they know, and identified which ones on that same spreadsheet they needed to send SDSs to. And they realized that some of the materials that some of the products that they made, in fact, uh, they would send an SDS, but there was nothing hazardous about the material they were sending. It didn't contain the sodium selenate, but they still sent the SDS. Um, but the ones that did, they, they made a uh, track to make sure they sent to them in a timely manner, which is a SARA requirement. Um, they spent time training their employees on all the hazards associated with each chemical. Um, and so not only the materials that they produced, but the materials, the raw materials that they received, and many of the other materials that they might have had in their maintenance area and other parts of your plant. So having a good list of what each one of those is, um, and from the SDS that you would have gotten with that, or in some of the maintenance chemicals right on the side of the container, oftentimes a can or, a, or some other container, um, you can identify what you need to do. And they made up a nice little matrix of what, uh, uh, again, uh, protective uh, equipment was required to, to uh, so someone wouldn't get exposed to the chemicals, which could have been gloves, could have been, um, an appropriate respirator, which would require medical clearance, but uh, could be proper clothing and whatnot, uh, glasses, goggles, face shields, things like that, um, and add that to the spreadsheet. They also chose to join the Chamber of Commerce. And I'll I use that term loosely because this is a hypothetical example, but uh, most of the industries in America are located somewhat in the proximity of a, a group of uh, businesses that get together on some timely manner, often called Chamber of Commerce, could have other names in your community or in your, in your area. And um, the benefit of that is uh, you get to spend time with other people that are maybe more experienced than you are, or uh, maybe you're new to the community uh, for the company you work for, it's a good chance to get to know who the people are. Oftentimes, many regulators that work, whether it be uh, for the state or for the county or for the city, uh, will attend these meetings and provide a wealth of information, not to mention offer you the opportunity to talk to them in a, in a safe environment where you can ask what you might think are dumb questions, but they're not. No such thing as a dumb question uh, in this world. Um, and they also offer, uh, many times uh, training opportunities that are put on um, by either some of their own members or sometimes they have guests that come in uh, again from the regulation side 
to, uh, to train you and provide you with information, which is, which is wonderful. Uh, and again, also there may be similar companies that make similar products to you. And I always like to say that the work we do on the compliance side really isn't something that uh, is a secret or a trade secret. I mean, it really isn't. We should share that information with each other quite, quite widely so that we can together protect the environment, protect our employees, uh, and, and uh, continue to make our products without having upsets that, that make the 11 o'clock news. And of course, there's more. Uh, um, uh, but this company, these folks learned about uh, state and local requirements, what I just talked about. Um, they also met people that could provide them with help, um, particularly around some of the reporting and usage and storage and what was on Sarah, what wasn't on Sarah, and some of these things. If you're trying to run a business, um, this compliance work is, is, a, is a tough, tough area to learn a lot about in a short amount of time. And so oftentimes help is needed. And, and so that's what they did. Um, they notified their emergency response organization. Uh, they even invited the fire department to come on down and walk through their facility and give them any good ideas that they might have. Or, or, uh, and normally one of the things that virtually every fire department in the US says to a company, if you invite them to come to your facility, is they ask you to label the doors so that they know where to go in. So uh, maybe a small thing, but um, if the fire department knows to go in door number two, that that's where the material is stored of concern, that's what they'll do. Okay, they took the time, this company took the time and, and again, complying with Sarah, sent in their uh, SDSs. Um, they worked with a similar business in the area that helped them make a contact with a consultant that could help them uh, correct air and wastewater permits. They they found that they their business had grown and um, they needed to change their air and wastewater permits and they weren't aware of that. Again, something that you, you just don't know every day if you run a facility, um, but it was very helpful. And um, they had a facility consultant that helped them with RECRA. And that really is what are the storage requirements, what are the transportation requirements, training requirements, things like that, which once set up, they could manage them themselves. Um, so if, if we think about moving down the road a little bit farther, um, no matter what your manufacturing or warehousing third party storage site is, we all have the same pile of rules to abide by. Um, and the unique part about it is that each one's a little bit different based on what you do and what you have. And so by, again, starting with a strong SDS, a pile of FDSs in a book, in a binder, in a hard drive located in a, in a file somewhere um, is the best place to start. That's how you can really start down the road to compliance uh, outside of the food safety FDA side. Um, and when you put that knowledge together, it's a lot easier to figure out what you got to do to be 100% compliant 100% of the time. And for sure, you'll know it. Um, so let's pull all this together. And we're getting close to, the, to, uh, to, to, to uh, wrapping it up. Um, again, I can't say enough about SDSs. Uh, when, you have, when, when they're good, uh, they really make your life a lot easier. For everything, from a training standpoint, from a um, uh, compliance standpoint, it's just the right right thing to do. Uh, training your employees. Uh, this is often something that <clears throat> we think we do enough of, and we do it the right way. But again, uh, we really need to go back and take a look at the SDSs and see what the exposure our employees might have, and from that exposure, decide on what the training is and document that training that so and so had it. Uh, and and, and um, provide them with the proper PPE and have them know how to inspect it and test it. You know, you shouldn't wear the same pair of earplugs day in and day out for weeks at a time. They're made to be disposable. Uh, they should be changed regularly. Same thing with gloves. Um, you know, gloves oftentimes um, at home, we use them for gardening and we we wear holes in the, in the fingers before we get tired of dirt getting in and replace them. That's not okay at work. 
because uh, we're handling chemicals there that may be of, of concern. Department of Transportation. Uh, this is one where there are a number of regulations for um, uh, receiving, storing, and transporting out materials, and we should make sure we're adhering to them and know and train our employees for that. And have all this on a rotating calendar and provide retraining uh, about once a year. Um, some, um, some, some of these areas require a, a deeper qualification than just an annual uh, toolbox type training, but uh, we should make sure we have that also on some sort of a schedule. Uh, uh, again, SDSs, you're going to hear that, you're tired of it by now, you'll wake up in the middle of the night and see SDS in front of your face. Uh, but uh, RECRA, it really is helpful to have a good SDS because it tells you how to dispose of it. Many times, unfortunately, on uh, SDS, as a matter of fact, most of the time, it says dispose uh, in a consistent with uh, rules and regulations of the state and county, local, whatever that you're associated with. So that's often not a lot of help. But, but uh, the good news is that if something is on the CERA list, that will trigger you to go to um, RECRA and see if, if that makes you have to dispose of something in a different way. Um, so the CERA comments on SDS are very helpful. Okay, and so uh, that's about all that I have to say today on this important subject. And I'm gonna turn this back over to Amy. That sounds great, thank you. Um, so if anyone has questions, please do type them in the question and answers box. Uh, I see we have a question here. Are the slides going to be distributed? And the answer is yes, uh, you should have them in your inbox already. Uh, we sent them out uh, probably about an hour and a half or so before the presentation. And while we're waiting on questions to come in, I'll just mention that Bob, of course, is a great resource. And if you have questions or needs for assistance uh, beyond this webinar, of course, EAS would be glad to help. Uh, you'll see Alan Saylor's information at the bottom. He would be your first point of contact. Um, you are also welcome to email me. You have my email uh, from the slides and I'll be glad to put you in touch as well. So we have our next question coming in and that is if you make a product from a variety of materials, for example, metal food packaging container that has been printed through a metal uh, lithography, I believe, and, and you have an SDS for each, should you send your customer the individual SDS sheets or do you have to create a new SDS for your product that you produce? Okay, I think I got it now, Amy, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. you should be able to click on the, the Q&A. Okay, yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, and so without uh, knowing all of what you're talking about, but the expectation is that the, um, the material, I'm trying to understand what you make here. Let's see, I'm going to package the, What you do to your packaging is not something that you normally need to notify your supplier of, uh, your, uh, your uh, customer of, uh, unless that is the product that you're sending to them. So as I read your question, um, uh, that, uh, we make, that your company makes a variety of products and materials, uh, and there's a metal food packing container. The container is not what's important unless you sell them the container. If you sell them container, yes. If you, um, if you ship your products in the container, you need to notify them of the material that's in the container. I hope that answered your, your question. Okay, thank you. And if the food is, if you're selling the food within the container? If, if, if it's the food- Like a can of soup or something like that? Yeah, the, the, that's, uh, probably the, the actual SDS, you're not gonna probably need to make an SDS for the food inside the container. That's probably gonna be covered under some of the other FDA requirements for notification. So yeah, I, I think the soup might not be the, the best example, but if you were <laughs> making, yeah, if you were making, um, if you were creating this can and in it, you were uh, uh, 
putting, let's say that that sodium selenate, you were a manufacturer of that material, then that would be it. You'd have to notify them. Ah, so the product in this case, uh, this gentleman responded back and said that the, the product in the container actually uh, that the container, let's see, oh, product in this case is the container. Okay, printed and made by the manufacturing plant. So um, that's a that's a great, a very good question, uh, and that would I would I'm going to answer that and say that um, the the lithography process uh, is likely not going to require you to notify them of that because when it's done, it's done. And so the raw materials, the things that were in the process ahead of the work uh, likely is not the same that's on the metal, uh, I, I'm assuming metal, but it could be wrong, uh, container. So I, I would say that you don't need to do that. Now, is it a bad thing to do? No. <laughs> the best thing you could do, for, if I, and I've run many a manufacturing plant, the best thing I would love to have would be from someone like yourself telling me what it is I'm, I'm getting, um, only because in case I have to dispose of any of these cans or containers with the lithography on them, um, I would want to know that uh, potentially for my disposal requirements. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for the clarification on the question. While we're waiting on our next question to come in, I'll just mention a few upcoming complimentary webinars that EAS is hosting. Our uh, next food focused webinar is on May 11th. And it will be a look at FDA food safety enforcement through uh, recent 483s and warning letters. Uh, additionally, we have a cosmetics regulations labeling and safety seminar that is coming up on April 28th, where they'll talk about GMPs, labeling requirements. Um, that is being presented in part by EAS Independent Advisor for Colors and Cosmetics, John Bailey, uh, and of course, Catherine Bailey, an independent consultant. For dietary supplements, we have on April 22nd, one on own label and private label distributor responsibilities. Uh, so that one is a webinar that you're welcome to join us. And then seminar wise, we have a GMP seminar coming up. That one starts May 5th. It's May 5th, uh, I'm sorry, May 3rd, 5th, 10th, and 12th. So I'm just looking, I don't see any other questions. We'll just wait another couple seconds in case there's a delay. Here we go, here's one. Uh, can you give us some ideas about how this is implemented in a quality management system? Yes, we can talk about that. Um, depending upon your facility. And so uh, it's, it's a little bit complicated. If you're a multi-plant facility, uh, you can do it through a central corporate uh, setup in which basically, uh, you know, you guys at, in the corporate area create what will look like the similar spreadsheet for each site and, and let them then identify what, how to populate that um, and go from there. If it's a single site operation um, and quality plays a key role in this uh, is again, I, I would recommend starting with uh, I first identifying you know, the SDSs and then going to create what are the materials of that may have some concerns from an OSHA standpoint and from an EPA standpoint um, and build that into uh, a matrix that ends up showing you what training needs to be done and, and all those types of things. So from a, a, a way to, to management and a quality management system or quality management style, I think that's probably uh, the best approach. Okay, great. Okay, I don't see any other questions coming in. So I will say thanks everyone again for joining us. Please do always uh, feel free to uh, contact us if you have questions or would like additional assistance with your own facility. Uh, thank you, Bob, today for your presentation. It was fantastic. I'm sure everyone learned quite a bit. I know I did. Um, 
And we look forward to seeing you at a future EAS training event soon. You're welcome to register for both webinars and seminars directly on our website. And we look forward to having you join us at another training. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great afternoon.